Mm-hmm. Okay, so welcome everybody to the first colloquium of this uh, academic year. There's no. Can you hear me? No. Shall I use this? You can take the mic. So, wow. <laughs> welcome everybody to the first colloquium of this academic year. It is a pleasure uh, to introduce Eiichiro Komatsu and uh, to have him here for today and for tomorrow, although tomorrow he will be busy. Uh, I have known Eiichiro for almost two decades now, which I think uh, you will uh, directly imply that we know each other since kindergarten. <laughs> um, so Eiichiro is the uh, director of uh, the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Munich, uh, Germany. And uh, he obtained his uh, PhD officially from Tokyo University in Japan uh, in 2001. However, well before getting his PhD, he was in Princeton, and uh, I was also in Princeton, and that's where we, we met. And we worked together for a few years, and we worked a lot in the WMAP uh, team, before the, even before the WMAP acquired the W in order of Dave Wilkinson. Uh, in honor of Dave Wilkinson. And we had many late night working, we had some skiing trips, and whatever happened in New Jersey stays in New Jersey. <laughs> um, so then he moved from there to the University of Texas in uh, 2003, and then from there to Munich. He's a world expert in cosmic microwave background, in general, in cosmology, in the astrophysics, in order to actually get to cosmology and in theory and data analysis. Uh, he received a few prizes uh, in chronological order, the Gruber Prize uh, in 2012, the AAS Lancet Berkeley Prize also in 2012, the, let's see if I pronounce it correctly, is from the Japan Society for Science, Shusuro Hayashi. Shusuro Hayashi, yeah. yeah my Great. Japanese accent is oh, not no, so good. good, prize in 2014, the Breakthrough Prize uh, for fundamental physics in 2018. So, without further ado, I leave the floor to Ichiro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Icha. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, of course, we worked uh, together, and uh, a few of the prizes that she mentioned, uh, we essentially share the prizes. So, <laughs> uh, right. So, I'm going to tell you uh, the work that we have been doing using the cosmic microwave background and I understand that uh, this is the uh, broad audience so I will uh, start with uh, uh, some generic introduction. So the breakthrough in cosmological research is that we can actually see the physical condition of the universe when it was very young using the uh, cosmic microwave background that I'm going to tell you today. So for example, universe was born and it's very hot and dense, it's expanding and uh, when the universe was hotter than 3000 Kelvin, electrons and uh, protons were separated and then electrons scatter photons very efficiently. So the universe was opaque, you cannot see through the universe. But uh, when the temperature dropped down to 3000 Kelvin, the universe became transparent to the photons. You can see things now. And these photons are now coming straight toward us. The very important thing about this movie is that uh, there were already irregularities, the ripples in the matter density in the early universe. Without that, no galaxies would form. So the question is, okay, so is this picture correct? According to the standard picture, small things form first and they merge together to form bigger and bigger and bigger structures inside of which you now have stars, planets around the stars and life will be born on those uh, planets and then for example some of these people, some of these lives will be listening to colloquium today. Okay, so that's the cosmic history. But is this correct? Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, big uh, question. So if you look at the sky in the optical bands at night, for example, southern hemisphere, this may be the sky you would see at uh, 
0.5 micrometers, 500 nanometers. But uh, if you can actually see using telescope, the sky at millimeter wave, microwave, then this is what you would see. The sky is filled with the photons from the uh, early universe, the uh, fireball universe, when the universe was hot and dense. So this light from the fireball universe is what's called the cosmic microwave background. Now when I give talks like this one, then you know people kind of get it, but not everybody gets it you know, in a kind of really uh, um, intuitive level. People say, oh yeah, such a nice story. Is that really true? I don't really understand. Light from the Big Bang, you know, why can't it be here? So uh, to address such uh, confusion, oh, they, by the way, I forgot to say that they are, you can count these photons. Now, there are 410 photons per one sugar cube, okay? So we know it's there. For sure it's there, but uh, it's sometimes it's not easy to understand that it's there. So to that, uh, I had this wonderful experience. When we do public outreach talks, what do we do? We typically go out to museums or schools, or we sometimes invite public people to the university, and researchers will tell them the stories, or research, okay? Not just stories, the research results. But we are sometimes, or often, terrible at doing such a job. Right? We do fantastic research, but we are terrible at communicating them. So this time, we decided to do, at the University of Tokyo when I was visiting, they organized the meeting, a symposium, for science communicators. So what we did was the public outreach event, only for science communicators, the professionals. Uh, could be curators, could be people working at the planetarium, artists, movie directors, poets, and musicians, and, and lots of other categories. One of the audience was director Hiromitsu Kosaka, whose specialty is to create a full dome movie. Uh, and uh, we created uh, this horizon beyond the edge of the visible universe. You can see the trailer on the YouTube if you the, uh, do this uh, search. Fortunately, this was uh, filmed uh, in Japan, uh, created in both Japanese and English. An English version has been shown at multiple uh, competitions for Fruto movies, and fortunately, we could get uh, pretty uh, good recognitions. So, uh, we cannot project this onto the dome today because there's no dome, but I can show you bits of it on the screen. Now, you have to imagine that it's actually Fruto dome, okay? So, what you see is a big uh, circle. The uh, middle will be Zenith, and you should imagine that the one of the sides will be in front of you, the other side will be behind you, and so forth. Okay? Let's go. The cosmic background radiation. Can you up the volume maybe a little bit? As a consequence of the expansion of the universe. The beginning of the universe was like a dense ball of fire. Everything was immersed in light. It was just like the center of the sun like a fog, where light couldn't travel straight. However, when the universe cooled down due to expansion, the fog cleared and light could travel farther. Shouldn't this light reach the Earth today? This light gives us the oldest picture of the universe that we can ever see directly. The wavelength of this light has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. And it has gone past visible light and turned into microwaves. Microwaves that come from every direction at once. That's the evidence for the expansion of the universe. So this makes my life very easy when I have to give the public lectures in colloquia. Uh, so uh, this is a wonderful thing. And uh, this light was discovered in 1964 by two gentlemen, uh, Arnold Pengius and Robert Wilson, when they were using this big horn antenna to measure brightness of one of the uh, astrophysics bodies called the supernova remnant. But then they saw some strange noise uh, in the sky. And uh, 
by the way, uh, if you go to Deutsches Museum in Munich, this is uh, uh, one of the world's, world's largest science technology museum. You can see one in 25th model of the antenna. And uh, this shows you that this antenna can move. And uh, therefore, you, you can point to uh, all the directions that can be seen from New Jersey. So this is a very nice telescope. And uh, What's the story? I mean, this story about the discovery of the cosmic microwave background is very interesting because these two gentlemen were trying to figure out what they were seeing. There was this uh, a noise that they could not remove, and this noise turns out to be light from the Big Bang. They didn't know. Then one of the friends uh, told them to contact a professor, uh, Roberto Dicke, in Princeton University, uh, whose team was specifically designed the experiment to look for this light from the fireball universe. So what happened when Robert Dickey received a phone call from them? I wonder if cleaning this up will get rid of that noise. We need to try everything that might work. <laughs> These two men were trying to observe microwaves coming from heavenly bodies with a radio telescope, but they encountered a mysterious noise. It was coming from all directions, and the intensity was the same no matter where they pointed their antenna. It's no good. It just won't go away. What does this mean? Hmm. I can't think of anything else to try. <sighs> oh, yeah. Do you remember the phone call we got the other day? The one about radiation from the universe and how some people are going to measure it. At Princeton University, uh, Dickey and... Uh, Wilkinson. Wilkinson. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's give them a call. Mm. The intensity of the waves is the same in all directions, right? Yes, that's right. We've tried everything to get rid of the noise. <sighs> it could be the cosmic background radiation. Cosmic background radiation? It's an evidence that the universe is expanding. What? An evidence that the universe is expanding? Wait, what? It's the light that was released when the universe began. So, that light is this noise, right? That's right. The expansion of the universe has stressed wavelength of the light to microwaves now. If we can show that the spectrum of those microwaves is a black body, we can say for sure that it's the cosmic background radiation. How will we be able to observe this? For those who already know a bit of CMB research and uh, maybe working on it, by the way, this movie, all the humans are real models. Everything else is uh, computer graphics. So this is very, very nice. This is Wilkinson. This is Jim Peebles. And this is Peter Roll. OK? Uh, if, you, if you know who they are, I uh, just wanted to point out. need to make this more sensitive. I know that. We should have done that in the first place. In order to do that, What happened? Well, boys, we've been scooped. So this is a real story. The fact that uh, Dicky said, well, boys, we've been scooped is, is right. I mean, this is documented. So uh, uh, this is a very animated story about the CMB. Uh, CMB research is very interesting. It's full of stories like that. And uh, um, so, uh, OK, now. You've seen this in the movie. This is the real detector system of Penzias Wilkinson experiment. Once again, this is shown in the Deutsches Museum. Now, why? Why is it in the Deutsches Museum rather than in, for example, a Hayden Planetarium in New York? Uh, that wouldn't have been a natural place to put something like that because the experiment was conducted in New Jersey. Because Arnold Penzias uh, was born in Munich. Uh, they had to uh, escape Germany because of the, the reason you know, probably, uh, back then. 
but uh, he decided to donate his uh, uh, machine to the Deutsches Museum. So uh, if you ever have a chance to go to Deutsches Museum, if you like this cosmic microwave background research, this is uh, uh, a, like a very special place to visit. Okay? For example, uh, okay, now you cannot see it very clearly, but in fact, uh, if you pay attention, uh, if you could see the, uh, the screen more clearly, I'm actually uh, reflected uh, here on this thing. I'm taking a picture. This is my leg, this is my face, and so forth. Uh, check, up, check out the slides later. So I was very happy to be there. And uh, so what do they do? Here, you have the whole antenna, and then as the antenna collected the light that was sent here, then it will be amplified because the uh, signal from the sky will be too faint to be recorded. So you amplify here and record. Very much like radio, where you receive the signal from the radio station, you amplify it, and then you hear it. But the important difference between radio and this machine, which is very expensive, is this calibrator. When you receive the signal from the sky, you do not necessarily know the signal in the physical units, for example, temperature, in terms of Kelvin. You don't know that. You just know some strength. Therefore, you switch between sky and this calibrator with known temperature, in this case, it's 5 Kelvin, to figure out the units of the signal strength you see in the sky. Then in 1964, May 20, uh, the day, the first day that Penn, Jess, and Wilson turned on their experiment, they knew immediately there was a problem. This is a recording, again shown in the Deutsches Museum. Time flows from bottom to, to uh, up, and then to the right is the bigger strength of the signal, to the left is the lower strength of the signal. Here, dip is the 5 Kelvin, it says cold load. It's 5 Kelvin. Uh, elevation 90 degrees is zenith, so this is the sky signal. And you see that the sky signal is bigger than 5 Kelvin. But uh, that's bizarre, because that shouldn't be the case. People knew already at the wavelengths of 7 cm, where Penges and Wilson are conducting the experiments, sky brightness is 2.3 Kelvin. It's not uh, bigger than 5. What they measured was 6.7 Kelvin. The sky temperature at zenith, at 7 cm, wavelength was 2.3. Antenna itself radiates some radiation, so that would be 0.8 Kelvin. Everything else they estimated is 0.1 Kelvin. If you do the subtraction, you have 3.5 Kelvin. Also, a uh, nice thing about this experiment is that if you look at this jitter here, it's, it's the noise. Noise is completely negligible compared to the amount of the signal you see here. This plus and minus seems like a big number. This is entirely due to systematic error, namely your knowledge of the temperature of the sky, your knowledge of the temperature of the radiation from the antenna, your knowledge of everything else. So this is a, a beautiful example where your experiment's results are completely dominated by systematics. Right? So therefore, they had to really understand where it came from and they had to clean the antenna, no? as you saw in the movie, which was, by the way, also a true story. Uh, okay, then, so their measurement was somewhere here from the ground base, and eventually you fly the satellite to measure this uh, uh, Planckian distribution of the CMB very, very accurately. So now we know that uh, c spectrum of the CMB, namely uh, brightness versus wavelength, is a very good fit to the Planckian distribution, the thermal distribution. Today it's not 2 Kelvin, which is yellow, not 4 Kelvin, that's magenta, it's 2.725 Kelvin, that's green. Of course, today's universe is not in thermal equilibrium, okay? otherwise we wouldn't exist. Uh, this indicates, therefore, that the universe in the past was hot and dense and was in thermal equilibrium. So this is the proof that the universe back then was hot. Now, what did Kobe see beyond this? Story doesn't end here. In 1989, the cosmic background radiation probe, Kobe, was launched into space. 
observations from outer space without disturbance by the atmosphere brought about a remarkable discovery. The spectrum of the cosmic background radiation matched the theoretical expectation of the Planck distribution. But the best was yet to come. The shape of this curve depends on the temperature of matter that emitted light. Using this property, the temperature of the cosmic background radiation was found to be minus 270.4 degrees Celsius. 2.7 Kelvin, of course. However, in detail, these curves vary slightly from place to place. That is, the temperature of the cosmic background radiation has fluctuations. So that was a big discovery, and uh, uh, let me put this into another context. So we have this full sky map of the uh, of light distribution on the sky. So to project the whole sky on the screen, we have this so-called galactic projection. And uh, now we go to the longer wavelength, visible to near infrared, far infrared, and sub millimeter. And eventually microwave. Then now we know that the entire sky is filled by this cosmic microwave background radiation from the fireball universe. But when you improve your sensitivity of the detector by factor of 100,000 times, you start seeing fluctuations at the level of 10 microkelvins. So this was discovered by Kobe, and uh, we. Uh, did these measurements with much higher angular resolution. So this was the WM science team. This is the uh, Wilkinson. And uh, Chuck Bennett is a PI of the mission. And uh, Richard was probably away when we took this picture, right? <laughs> unfortunately, but uh, you know, we still look very young. Uh, this is David Sprogo. If you know him uh, as of today, then you notice that uh, he changed a lot. <laughs> uh, all right. He now looks like a movie star, some mafia movie. Uh, okay, so uh, so WM up did this measurement with improved the the map resolution. Improved upon the Kobe in many ways and succeeded in measuring temperature fluctuations of the cosmic background radiation with 35 times better angular resolution. So we really made an exquisite measurement of the CMB. And the one thing that was quite remarkable about this is that this light was emitted in a very, very early time. This measurement shows that there were ripples, irregularities in the distribution of photons, which must have meant that there was irregularities in the matter distribution also. So we see light distribution from which we infer the distribution of matter. If there was the uh, in homogeneity in the matter distribution in the early universe, there's more matter here, there's less matter there. If you have more matter, matter accretes onto that and then grows. Eventually they form galaxies within which you form stars, planets, life, and you're listening to me. So, but uh, now the question is, okay, that's fantastic, but what generated these initial ripples? It's like, you know, uh, you, have, you have kids, let's say, and then kids will ask you, mom, where did I come from? And you say, yeah, yeah. Huh? Uh, but then uh, they will ask you where you came from, and you say, I came from your gra grandma. And then you go back in the history of your family tree, and eventually you said, we came from ocean. We came from Earth. Where did Earth come from? Then you remember what you learned in the uh, university when you took astronomy course, if you ever took one. We came from protoplanetary disk around the sun. We came from the solar system. We came from the Milky Way. Galaxy, where did the galaxy come from? Then you say, go to bed. It's none of your business. <laughs> it's late, okay? Now you say, we all came from Initial fluctuations in the early universe. Now kids say, where did that come from, mom? <laughs> mm. Go to the university. <laughs> or, yeah, 
go to bed. <laughs> now we can answer some of the some of that question, and the kids continue to ask questions. Right? So, but it's a, it's a it's non-trivial task because what we see is this one. The time is going to the right. We're observing right from now. In the past light gone, we we intersect this uh, last threatening surface where the universe became transparent to the photons. But how do we go beyond that? Because beyond that, the universe was too opaque to see directly by the light. So here we use the laws of physics. The cosmic background radiation is the wall at the edge of the visible universe. We cannot see directly the further past beyond this wall. But these temperature fluctuations may tell us what happened in the further past. The conditions beyond the wall of the cosmic background radiation could be thought of as a liquid with high temperature and high density. You could say it was like a hot soup. Something happened behind this wall that made waves, which can be seen in the fluctuations in the cosmic background radiation. There must have been a grand sound that shook the universe. We can learn a great deal about the universe if we can extract this cosmic sound. The origin of the sound would be the moment of the birth of the universe. So this is what we use. We use the sound wave patterns we see on the sky and infer what generated it. Now this movie really makes my life easy because explaining this would be highly non-trivial. And but what I was impressed was that uh, this movie director is not a scientist. He's a movie director. But uh, when he just came up with this first time, I didn't make any comments. It's super accurate, even scientifically. I mean, this is exactly what we do. We make an impact at the beginning, create sound waves. That's what we see. Okay? This is exactly what it is. And uh, now, what generated the uh, initial fluctuations? The leading idea is that it's a quantum mechanical fluctuation. Okay? Now you have to say your kids. You, we all came from quantum fluctuations. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, but what do we mean? I mean, in this room, there are quantum mechanical fluctuations, but they do not become relevant on macroscopic scales. They are too small to be seen. Missing link in the early universe is perhaps there was this incredible uh, accelerated expansion of space that stretched the wavelength of microscopic quantum fluctuation to the macroscopic pick uh, wavelengths. Then they seed the initial fluctuations that eventually grow into galaxies. And it's really remarkable to think like that. I mean, OK, we are trying to verify this theory. We're almost there. Not quite, perhaps. Almost there. But if you pound upon it, it's remarkable. Einstein's, you know, is a uh, uh, famously uh, known to say things like God doesn't play with dice. But eventually what this is saying that uh, we, we kind of chosen by chance. Initially there was a dice, quantum mechanical fluctuations. Once dice was thrown, it's five. There's a galaxy. You know? So initially it was all random, quantum mechanical, but afterwards, once their wavelengths got stretched outside the horizon, and then uh, became, became macroscopic fluctuations, destiny is chosen. Yeah? So after that, it's uh, deterministic evolution. So the key predictions of uh, this scenario called inflationary scenario is that fluctuations we observe today in the cosmic microwave background as well as the fluctuations in the matter, matter distribution originated from quantum mechanical fluctuation during inflation, but they also predict that there should be very, very long wavelength gravitational waves in the sky. And uh, that's the second subject is really what we are doing uh, at the moment. But let me first explain the first part too. So we measure distortions in space. In uh, uh, Cartesian coordinate, you have distance between two points, which is given by dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. 
But because of the expansion of the universe, you have an um, overall factor multiplying the distance, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. This grows over time. Then you also have these uh, deviations from Cartesian coordinates, which you call curvature. So the uh, perturbations to this, uh, uh, so this is called scalar mode, this is called tensor mode, for the reasons I explain later. Now, inflation is an accelerated expansion. So by definition, this means that the uh, second time derivative of a scale factor is positive. Now let me define a very important quantity called Hubble expansion rate. That's h, which depends on time. This will be a dot over a. If you define that, then a double dot over a can be written in this way. This has to be greater than zero. Therefore, this quantity called epsilon minus h dot divided by h square has to be less than one. So if you can show that uh, this quantity is less than one observationally, we prove inflation. That's the evidence that the inflation actually happened. For various reasons, it's not enough that the epsilon is less than one, it's actually much, much less than one. Something like 10 to minus 2 or 10 to minus 3. So, have we seen that yet? To achieve this, we need to map out this Hubble expansion uh, history as a function of time. We we call this Hubble diagram, usually, but uh, how do you do this? So here comes the uh, uncertainty principle, okay? So uh, uncertainty principle tells you that if you promise to return your money immediately, you can borrow money from bank, a lot of money. For example, you go to Santander Bank, and then you ask for uh, one euro for one day, and they look at you and they, they think you are poor or crazy, and then they lend you one euro, and you return the ne next day. But if you ask for one million euro for one day, they're not going to lend you, and they call your police, but, uh, 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 or ambulance. And then, but if you promise to return it in cash, in one second, they might do it just for fun. They are you know, kind of bored. You get one million, you, 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 you might one million back, right? Just like that, you, have, you borrow the energy from the vacuum, if you promise to return it uh, soon. So, energy you can borrow is inversely proportional to the time you borrow, and this h is a dot over a has a dimension of 1 over time. So, this tells you that uh, you can actually borrow a lot of energy, you can create a lot of curvature perturbations, uh, and this amplitude will be proportional to h. Now, here's the key. Um, Let's see. So, epsilon is much less than 1, which means h hardly changes. Okay? So, first thing you should show is that h is roughly constant over time. The next thing you want to show is that because inflation has to end, h is a slowly declining function over time. So, you want to show that too. But how do we do that? Right? So, here is not that difficult to understand uh, principle. Let me explain, because this is the most important concept. Inflation has a duration. There's a beginning and there's an end. It's, the, uh, it's taking some time. Brief, but uh, taking some time. Therefore, fluctuations are generated at time one. This amplitude will be proportional to Hubble expansion rate at that time. Once fluctuations are generated, the wavelength will be stretched. Sometime later, fluctuations are generated again, time two, and they'll be stretched. And the amplitude will be proportional to Hubble at that time. Because, because it's a later time, fluctuation generated later would have slightly smaller amplitude. Okay? Now, here's a trick. Because the fluctuations that were generated earlier had more time to be stretched, they are longer wavelength today. Okay? So if you look in the sky, 10 degree scale fluctuations were generated earlier than 1 degree scale fluctuations. So what you want to show now is the amount of temperature fluctuations in the CMB would not depend on angles. That would be the first thing to show. Second thing you show is that Amplitude of temperature fluctuations is 
slowly decreasing as you go to smaller and smaller angular scales. One degree fluctuation will be slightly smaller than 10 degree, 10 degree. one arc minute fluctuation will be slightly smaller than one degree fluctuation. That's what we want to show, right? So to do that, we decompose the temperature fluctuations in the sky into a set of cosine sine waves, and then make the diagram showing the strength of each wavelength. Too complicated. So, uh, but uh, here's the result. To the left is long wavelength, to the right is shorter wavelength. So what are we looking here? Okay. Uh, so if you decompose the uh, sky into a set of cosine sine, this uh, leftmost uh, points correspond to the uh, fluctuation whose wavelength is as big as the sky. And as you go to the right, you start seeing these uh, smaller wavelength, finer scale structures. And once you've done that, Right? So these are your decompositions. And of course, eventually, you then put them all together back, you get the original sky back. So this is what we do, just Fourier decomposition analysis, just that uh, we're dealing with a uh, uh, spherical sky, so it's a bit complicated. Okay. So uh, what are we looking at here? First of all, let me actually say that uh, if you look at this, clearly what I said didn't work. Fluctuation goes up and down, up and down, up and down. It's not like ten, one degree slightly smaller than 10 degrees, one arc may slightly. Uh, it's not like that at all, okay? So what, did, what, what went wrong? Uh, what we forgot uh, is that universe was like a, a soup. When you make an impact, you create ripples. By the way, do, do you know what this is? <laughs> so this is a... Uh, uh, so the miso, uh, cosmica. So uh, universe is a bit like miso soup, and when you drop tofu, this uh, soybean stuff that uh, Japanese like very much, it creates ripples. And if you put too much miso in it, the uh, soup became so viscous that fluctuations will be damped like that. So this is the universe where there's too much atoms. There's too much hydrogen in helium. So equivalent to MISO. So by analyzing the pattern of these waves, you can figure out how much atoms hydrogen helium there is. So there's a definitive prediction for that. MISO suit physics, not that difficult to do. When you g change the uh, fractional matter besides atoms, like dark matter, you have different patterns. So after all that, you, cr you have this uh, remarkable discovery that today, only 5% of the universe is made of atoms, and the rest is something we don't understand. And uh, of course, uh, in Barcelona, ICC, uh, a lot of people working exactly what they are. And just ask them uh, if they know, have any idea what they are, actually. <laughs> Let's see. But that's not the topic of today's colloquium. Today's colloquium is who dropped the tofu into this cosmic missile soup? Okay. <laughs> who did that? Because without that initial impact, there will be no sound waves. And the remarkable uh, hypothesis now we have is that nobody dropped the tofu, okay? Tofu quantum mechanically emerged from the vacuum. <laughs> That's bizarre. I mean, is that really true? Okay. To do that, we first remove the ripples, the, remove these uh, uh, sound waves, because we understand missiles very well. I mean, it's just a fluid, fluid mechanics or a bit of both migration, not a big deal. Then we try to reconstruct how much fluctuation there was at the beginning. Okay. Was tofu dropped with equal amplitude at all scales or not? This will be early, this will be large angular scale, so this will be earlier time in inflation. This will be later time in inflation. And depending upon what inflation was doing, it could be doing that, could be doing that, right? So we try to figure out this uh, very complicated structure. So we uh, parameterize this by a power uh, and then try to figure out what that power index is. If we had an equal amplitude everywhere, NS would be one. In this situation where smaller scale has slightly smaller amplitude and it should be less than one. And this is the dream of cosmologists. We really wanted to discover this. 
In 1994, the final Kobe, uh, the Kobe, sorry, Kobe two year results was this NS was consistent with one. You see, the first thing we wanted to show was that NS is roughly one, so that the amplitude of fluctuations is roughly constant of angles. So that was uh, kind of achieved uh, in 1994. People were very excited. People who were working on inflation were very excited. Now, uh, 20 years later, uh, after all the WMAP data uh, we have had, we found that NS is a bit less than one, but uh, up to about two point something sigma. Interesting hint, but not, uh, uh, not yet a very strong evidence. But then, WMAP had the diameter, antenna had a diameter of 1.5 meter, because you can't really launch six meter dish or 10 meter dish to the space for the various constraints. But you, but you can do that on the ground. So you put six meter dish in Chile, you put 10 meter dish in South Pole, and now you can measure much finer structures. Then with this longer lever arm, you can get NS, less than one at 3.5 sigma. Now that's usually enough to convince cosmologists, but uh, if we wanted to really teach our kids, you came from quantum mechanical fluctuations, we should do better than 3.5 sigma, okay? Now when we combine, because that was a limit we could do in uh, December 2012, uh, we wanted to do a bit better by combining this with the distribution of galaxies. Then we discover that NS was less than one at five sigma. So that would be significant enough to claim a discovery. So we did that in December 2012. But then we also had, uh, I mean, we were excited to report that, but uh, there was this uh, worry that uh, uh, maybe Galaxy is doing something that we don't understand. Then a few months later, ESA's Planck satellite, which was a successor of WMAP, made for the first time CMB only discovery. So they combine Planck measurements and WMAP measurements to, to have this NS less than one, more than five sigma using CMB alone. And the results are fully consistent with what we said in, in a few months before. So that's a relief, okay? Oh, so we actually came from quantum mechanical fluctuations. But we wanted to do a little bit better. So for example, uh, we used uh, uncertainty principle to make this prediction that NS is less than one, right? So it's pretty quantum mechanical. But what about other properties? For example, quantum mechanical fluctuations on a ground state obey a Gaussian distribution. Wave function is a Gaussian on ground state for non-interacting uh, quantum fields. So this is the temperature fluctuation versus histogram. And then, uh, does the WNAP data match Gaussian? And it does. To the accuracy, which is quite un un unbelievable. So uh, to do this, for example, Gaussian is a symmetric distribution. So you just multiply this distribution by temperature cubed and integrate. If the distribution is asymmetric, this will give you non-zero value. Well, you can do even better than that. You multiply three temperatures at different locations in the sky, called the three-point function, and see if you see any evidence for departure from Gaussianity, and there was none. So if you parameterize the, uh, this uh, initial curvature fluctuation by Gaussian plus Gaussian square with some unknown coefficient, then we discuss, so this zeta is, is uh, one part in uh, 100,000, so it's small value, it's 10 minus five, 10 minus 10. Okay, super tiny. Then if you multiply this by factor of 10 or something, then you realize that uh, the second term shall be smaller than the first term uh, by like 0.2%. So this should, should exceed 0.2% of the first term. That's, that's very Gaussian. And Planck improved our limit by a factor of 10. So now second term cannot be more than 0.03% of the first term. That's remarkably Gaussian. Certainly the most Gaussian thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, so have we found inflation? Can we, can we claim a victory? Not yet. So there are things that I haven't talked to you about, superhorizon, diversity, but these I talked about to you. These are very, very important evidence for inflation that we got from WMAP and confirmed, confirmed by Planck. What more do we want? Gravitational waves. Why? Because the 
extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. If you wanted to teach your kids you came from quantum fluctuation, you better make sure that you are doing uh, something right because they may lose sleep at night. Um, I'm so scared. Do I disappear someday because I'm quantum fluctuation? No. Kids are smart, no? They, they worry too much. So gravitational waves modify, uh, because we can't see gravitational waves by eyes, so what we do is to put test particles. You have a ring of particles in front of you. Gravitational waves are coming from the back of the screen toward you. What they do is to do this area conserving distortion of the space time. Because it's area conserving, it's not generating any density fluctuations. But this can propagate through the universe, and we hope to measure this. How do you measure this? For example, you have two mirrors, and then shoot a laser from the left. Your beam split, and then one beam goes there, comes back, another beam goes there, comes back. You combine when they came back. You tune the phases of these lasers such that if nothing happens, troughs and crests of laser lights will cancel, and then you have no signal. That would be the initial configuration. When gravitational wave passes through, this initial configuration is broken, and then you start seeing the signal. Okay, beautiful. That's what LIGO did, and they uh, discovered uh, gravitational waves from the binary black holes. But the wavelength of this gravitational wave is a thousand kilometers, or a few thousand kilometers. But we are after gravitational waves whose wavelength is billions of light years. So you just cannot do what LIGO did to detect gravitational waves from inflation. So what we do is to use the universe as a detector. We have this isotropic electromagnetic fields in the universe called the cosmic microwave background. When space is stretched and contracted, stretched and contracted, wavelengths of light is also stretched and contracted, stretched and contracted. And if you put uh, an electron here, this electron will see uh, longer wavelengths photons from the horizontal direction and the, from vertical direction you see shorter wavelengths photons. So this will be hot, this will be cold. And uh, if, you, if, if you see that, that this hot and hot is scattered by electron, cold, cold, scattered by electron, the light is coming toward you. You see them polarized. How do you know that? We actually kind of see this in a daily life. So, for example, if you see a windshield of the car, sunlight is coming from the above. It's reflected by the uh, windshield. Light is coming toward you. It's horizontally polarized. How do you know that? Because if you then buy polarized sunglasses, which you block light, uh, horizontally polarized, and only transmit the light that's vertically polarized, then you can see through the car. Okay? So we use the same kind of principle to detect polarization from the cosmic micro background. The necessary and sufficient condition to produce polarization is that you have scattering or reflection, and you need to have anisotropic incident light. For example, in this case, sunlight comes only from the above. Universe doesn't have a preferred direction, but locally, because of this gravitational wave, Electron can see locally anisotropic incoming radiation. That's the key. Okay. All right. Then we quantify the amplitude of gravitational wave fluctuations with respect to the uh, uh, by by means of this tensor to scalar ratio. So this amplitude of gravitational wave squared divided by the amplitude of gravitational potential squared. We haven't detected this yet. We really want to see this. Current bound is less than 0 0.06, and we keep going on. But uh, if we plot then this phase diagram where the vertical axis is tensor to scalar ratio r, uh, horizontal axis is primordial tilt ns, so ns is less than 1. Great. Wonderful. What are these dots? Uh, so we haven't detected gravitational waves. That's why this contour doesn't close. It touches 0. In future, we want to close it. Okay. What are these dots? You don't have to know what they are really, but I just wanted to say that these are the predictions of some of the inflationary universe. This is the physics in a very, very high energy scale, a very, very early time. It used to be 
that you can say, you can propose any models of inflation. Say, this is physically motivated, this is not. If you don't have any constraints, so you can produce many, many papers. Not anymore. Look, this is gone. This is completely ruled out. So you're not allowed to talk about this anymore. You're not allowed to teach in the class. But this used to be the, the thing that you teach in class. And when I was a master student uh, uh, in Tohoku University, I learned that this is the most natural model of inflation. But once we rule this out in 2007, I started to hear that this was never motivated. This is the least physically motivated model. <laughs> this, is, this is good. You know, M square, five square. So people started to talk about this. Now it's gone. And uh, then you're not allowed to talk about this anymore. No, now everything's gone. It's pretty much, okay? So now, now what? <laughs> so we are in a situation where kind of I don't trust anybody anymore. As when people say this is natural or whatnot, who cares? We just want to measure this thing, okay? So, uh, May 21st this year, we heard a wonderful news that our next satellite is selected to fly. This is the JAXA-led mission, Japanese Space Agency. This is the first time that Japan will launch something on CMB. But behind, we... Not the first time, you tell the story of the real first one. The space, not the rocket. A rocket, yeah, you tell the story, it's a very interesting story. Yeah, but uh, that, that, then I'll be really out of time. Uh, so uh, I, I can tell you that, sure, yeah, but uh, this is a space mission, okay, not the rocket. It's the first time that the space agency launches something on CMB. And uh, all right, there, there's a participation from NASA, Canadian Space Agency, and Europe. Target is essentially 100 times better than what we are now. Okay? And if everything goes well, we expect to launch this in 2028. With that, uh, so we, uh, this is the polarization satellite dedicated to measure CME polarization from gravitational waves. We put a few thousand superconducting detectors in space and trying to do this measurement. Let me skip this. So, uh, so uh, the summary is that uh, regarding the theory of the early universe, it's a remarkable idea, but the inflation actually still looks very good. All the data that we have so far support it. So we all came from quantum fluctuations. Next to frontier is to use CMB polarization to find gravitational waves from inflation. That will be definitive evidence for inflation. But let me really emphasize the fact that most people are convinced that inflation happened. But uh, to close the kind of loop, we, it, be, we, it would be wonderful to have this measurement done. Okay? Then with light bus satellite, we are planned to reach uh, R of 10 to minus 3. The current up around is 0.06, so nearly 100 times better, and we hope to see something there. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ichiro. So, uh, are there any questions? I'm sure there are many questions. I'm sure you get this question quite often, but doesn't this push the uh, where do we come from question just back one step? and? The okay. same question is, what are the implications of this for the rest of physics? Yeah. So, uh, yes, indeed, once we discover this gravitational waves from inflation, and kids will ask us, where did the quantum fluctuation come from? Right, that would be the question. And uh, then we just say, it's your turn. Go to university, and then uh, go to University of Barcelona, and then, then go to ICC, and uh, do it yourself. So that would be. Yeah, we are pushing things back, back. That's science, no? We make progress. What's the implication for the rest of the, the physics? So we are really probing the physics at the energy scale of 10 to the 14 GeV. 
for, for example, this Hubble constant, Hubble expansion rate, has the dimension of 1 over time. If you, if you convert that into the energy scale, it's 10 to the 14 GeV. This will be the energy scale that's completely inaccessible to the uh, humankind on Earth. Okay? So implication will be huge. This will be really in the realm of um, like a string theory, or if not, you know, uh, it was just probing the high energy physics. For example, if is the, really the gravitational wave we see was generated quantum mechanically? If so, we're seeing essentially quantized perturbations in space time, gravitons, right? So, uh, that's pretty cool, no? So, uh, so I think the implication will be, will, be, will be quite important. In fact, uh, we've seen that already. In 2014, there's a group of uh, experimentalists who claim the discovery of polarization from inflation. It turns out that this signal was due to uh, galactic uh, dust, which is also polarized, so the so signal was confused. But uh, then, but once the announcement was made, people jumped into it and wrote many papers on what the implications for fundamental physics. So there's a rehearsal, if you want. So we know that there's a tremendous impact for the rest of the physics. So I think, uh, I think this is good. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, so this may be quite naive. You mentioned that we know that inflation has to begin at some at some point. Yes. So is there any experimental evidence that is definitely telling us that inflation has to begin at some point? Not yet. Okay. But uh, that's not kind of an impossible question to answer experimentally in principle. So how, how could we... Yes. So... Um, Earlier, the fluctuations were generated, the bigger, the angular scales, they subtend, right? Yeah. So this is the largest scale or earliest period of time that we can probe. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yep. If inflation began here, it didn't have to, yeah. but if it did, we have access okay. to the physical beginning of inflation. And... Uh, if inflation began before this, it would be difficult to reach out to the beginning, but uh, here. And we don't really know how much inflation we had for our universe. Okay. So we, we keep, keep searching for such evidence, and it's, it's possible to at least put the bounds on, on such a physics at the beginning, experimentally. Okay, thank you. What do you imply by natural when it comes to how inflationary theories are motivated? Very nice. I mean, I just don't buy the argument anymore. <laughs> but let's say, what do you mean by natural, okay? So this, uh, the reason why this model oops, was considered natural was, uh, first of all, this in inflation, the energy field that generated the inflation it's called a scalar field, it's phi. And uh, for some time, we just didn't have a fundamental scalar field uh, experimentally discovered. But there was one proposal made, which is a Higgs field. Higgs field has a potential, and that potential has this term. So if Higgs works, there should be it's completely okay to have a scalar field with this potential. That's why people thought this would be, would be the very motivated model of inflation. Except that if you just take Higgs uh, parameter values for Higgs, actual standard model Higgs, inflation doesn't happen. Therefore, this parameter has to be a bit fine-tuned, and this wouldn't be scalar uh, Higgs, but it's something that looks like Higgs. That's why people liked it a lot, once it's ruled out, nobody talks about this anymore. But uh, there is a model, for example, um, that couples this Higgs field to a uh, rich scalar of the uh, space-time curvature to make it work. And uh, if you do that, then the prediction goes somewhere here. So it's a good, good uh, fit to the data still. 
So yeah, but uh, if you don't do that, if you, this scalar field is not non-minimally coupled to gravity, then it's ruled out. Only way to save this is to couple that non-minimally to the gravity, and then you are here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Uh, you mentioned in the end just a proposal from Japan. Yeah. Are there any other proposals? I mean, what is the status in improving this information? Thank you for asking that question because I have lots of. Uh, <laughs> First of all, uh, however, let me say that uh, yes, there are, there have been many proposals to space agencies, NASA and ESA, to, to do this. And they're all turned down, and the light bulb is the only kind of surviving mission that's approved. I think the reason why NASA and ESA kept declining this proposal is that uh, this is a, a bit risky experiment because if there was no gravitational wave that's detectable, this mission will not see evidence for inflation. It will do other wonderful things, but uh, it just doesn't do the, what it promised to do. And NASA and ESA just didn't want to take that risk. They're, they're in kind of victim of their own success because Kobe and WMAP were highly successful Planck was highly successful, they could not kind of conceive of launching something that's so risky. Japan, we take it. Right? That's what they said, essentially. It's, the implication is huge. Why don't we go for it? And uh, so that, that's it. Now, of course, you don't really have to. Uh, that's not the only way. Okay? If you wanted to do, you can do this from the ground also to, to, to a certain extent. And there are lots of ground-based experiments going on, and they all try to do the same thing, but uh, they're kind of running out of money. Each mission is at $10 million level. If you want to go to the next level, then you combine, and you have a $100 million experiment. If that's not enough, you create $500 million experiment. <laughs> so that's the, the uh, ground-based community is going, so essentially joining the forces together to maximize the funding. Space, there's a space, also there are balloons. You can launch balloons and do the measurements. So uh, these three are main avenues, and uh, balloon, ground-based, uh, taking data as we speak now. Space mission is a bit futuristic, but we need that to have a definitive say on the measurements. Yeah. So ideal scenario for me is they s discover something first, they will make the definitive measurement from space. That will be that will be a wonderful scenario for the community. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, uh, building on your example of the miso soup. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering. Sorry. Um, Will, will there be a difference, for example, if you throw all the tofu at the same time yes. or one at a time because you will have some interference pattern? And can you be sensitive to like a inflation BO where you have like different... Good. So the fact that uh, we see these uh, fluctuations at all angular scales means that it wasn't the it wasn't the case that tofus are dropped at once. They are continuously dropped. Well, they're, they're continuously quantum mechanically emerged, you see? So there was a bang, tofu, and, but, and nothing else. It's not like that. It's a bum, 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 okay? Then bum, stretched, bum, stretched, bum, stretched. And each wavelength is different, so it subtend. Uh, these, ang these wavelengths will subtend different angles. That's why we, power we see the fluctuation power at all scales. That's the key in prediction of inflation. Yeah. Nobody else? Let me um, uh, make a little remark. So um, you show us how you, know, you, you look 
to the cosmic macro background and try to infer something about fundamental physics and the very early universe. But there are a three, a, at least three big examples, which you know, we all have in our head, uh, where everything that comes in between, between us and the cosmic macro mm -hmm. background, all that astrophysics, yes. uh, gets uh, tightly coupled with the final result. And we have seen the story of tau, where all the astrophysics goes into these effective parameters. We have seen the example of uh, the, the initial bicep interpretation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have seen, for example, the lensing and SE clusters, yeah. etc. But at the same time, we've learned about all that astrophysics. Yeah. But it's an heroic effort, and and things get fixed eventually because of this heroic effort. And since you've been part of this heroic effort, I want to give you the opportunity to spend a few words about that. Foreground or astrophysics or both? Uh, well, everything that is in between us observing and the last scattering surface. And you have both secondary, you have astrophysics, and then of course you have our own galaxy in the foreground. Yeah. And we've learned a lot about all of this. And they've all made ad initially, uh, you know, Get the result that it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not quite. That's right. So, so, um, so, um, yeah, Richard is right. Uh, CMB is the, not the only thing in the sky. There's lots of other things. For example, uh, uh, hot electrons circling around the magnetic fields emitting synchrotron radiation that's highly polarized. Their spectrum drops as we go to higher frequencies. And there's a thermal dust emission that's rising as you go to the higher frequencies. So if you have a multiple frequency bands, you can separate them from CMB, which looks like that. The bicep, initial bicep result uh, that Richard was mentioning, this 2014, had only one channel. So they could not separate dust and CMB. That's why they are confused. But if you have uh, more bands, you, you can separate them. But uh, from the ground, uh, you can't, because of the atmospheric uh, uh, emission, you can't really go to too high frequency bands. At least, as of today, all the CM experiments are limited to frequencies less than 270 GHz. <laughs> this is even, this is very challenging. Unless you go to Mars on, on Earth, which is this. So, so this is the mountain uh, Cerro Chazanto uh, in Chile. It's 5,600 meter, very, very high sight. If you go there, suddenly uh, water uh, vapor's uh, thickness drops substantially, and it opens up the uh, window to these very high frequency channels from the ground. So we are going to put a telescope up there to complement all the uh, ongoing activities uh, of the other CMB experiments. We, we, clean, we, we map and clean the dust with unprecedented precision. Also, we learn a lot about dust emission with very high angular resolution. So this is a German telescope. If you give Germany steel, they create something you know, really uh, great. <laughs> and if you wanted to have even more frequency bands, you go to space and you have 15 bands continuous between 40 years and 400, for example. That's what the light body will accomplish. So this uh, distinguishing between CMB and uh, uh, other stuff in the galaxy is a very important thing. But you can also use this to learn about hot gas in the universe. When the uh, universe is filled with hot gas, it is, we know that, CMB photons will be scattered by these hot electrons they are Compton upscattered, so they gain energy. And their spectrum is no longer black body spectrum. I mean, on average, they are black body, sort of, but uh, there are individual spots in the sky, for example, toward the direction of galaxy clusters. Their hot electron upscatter CMB photons, creating so called distortion in a Planckian distribution, which you can separate if you have so many frequency bands. So people have done that. And with this, you can map all the hot gas in the universe. That's a wonderful measurement. Another effect is that the CMB photons are deflected. The directions of CMB photons are not completely straight. They're deflected. Gravitational lensing. That you can measure also. This will give you the map of all the matter in the universe. So if you use CMB, you can learn wonderful things about the early universe as well as 
You can learn about galactic science, synchrotron and dust and magnetic fields if you have so many frequency bands, and you can learn about all the hot gas in the universe, and you can learn about all the matter in the universe, including dark matter. And <laughs> I thought I forgot something. Uh, well, there are many other wonderful things. <laughs> and, it's, and it's beautiful mathematics for uh, signal processing and image processing, because yeah, basically yeah. that's how it goes. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's thank Ichiro again for this uh, a very interesting colloquy. Thank you. Uh, don't go, one sec. At 4, we will meet uh, Ichiro in the um, ICC room for the students, whom, whoever wants to come. And then I guess uh, you're not running away just after, so if, uh, if some staff wants to also meet uh, Ichiro, around 5 can show up at the 7th the floor at the ICC and talk with uh, Ichiro again. Okay, let's thank again. Gracias.